What is early Buddhism? It's something I've mentioned from time to time on this channel, but never really discussed in detail. So in today's video, we'll get into early Buddhism. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So early Buddhism. Oftentimes I'll describe the, the aim of this channel as describing Buddhism or, or, or divulging, uh, informing you about Buddhism from an early perspective, from an early Buddhist perspective, uh, from a modern sort of understanding of early Buddhism. And that's well and good, but then the question comes, what is early Buddhism? And I, I sort of wonder why I have, you know, it's been several years now and I've never really done an in-depth uh, video on what early Buddhism is. And I think to an extent that's because uh, early Buddhism is something that's in flux. It's something that we're learning about all the time. It's something that remains controversial, that remain, there remains differences of opinion about what early Buddhism really is. And it's also kind of fluid. We're learning new things all the time about early Buddhism. And so it's best not to be too rigid about what we consider early Buddhism to be, because something that we may think very rigidly about, we might find is not the case when we do the actual research, which is what's ongoing nowadays. And what we do want to say about early Buddhism is that it's different from any of the contemporary Buddhist schools. It's, it's not the same, for example, as Mahayana. It's not the same even as Theravada. Theravada is the contemporary Buddhist school that's the closest to early Buddhism, but even in that case, there's a difference, and we have to keep that in mind. Uh, there are uh, places we can find about early Buddhism, place, uh, resources that we can use on the internet, and I'll get to some of that uh, later on in the video, but for now, we just have to keep in mind that it's, it's different from any of the contemporary Buddhist schools that we're going to find. And some people do indeed believe that there isn't any such thing, really, as early Buddhism. I got, I, I discussed a little bit of that subject when I did an earlier video on, uh, er, on whether the Buddha existed, uh, because it's the same kind of issue, whether we think the Buddha existed, whether we think there is such a thing as early Buddhism that can be reconstructed and known about. And I'll put a link down to that, uh, to that earlier video down below in case you're interested in hearing more about that. Uh, but for now, what we need to know is that early Buddhism is a kind of a, a scholarly reconstruction of what Buddhism might have been, uh, given the material we find in what are called the early Buddhist texts. The early Buddhist texts are these, uh, are really our, our sole source of information about early Buddhism. And we go to these texts and read them and try to reconstruct from them what this practice and belief might have been like. Now, what are the early Buddhist texts? That's the obvious next question. And uh, to, to answer that question, I will uh, take as my jumping off point uh, a paper by uh, Bhikkhu Sujato and Bhikkhu Ramali on the uh, authenticity of these early Buddhist texts. They gave a, a long paper, uh, a long discussion about uh, whether these texts were in any, to, to any extent trustworthy. And in that paper, they described, they, they listed what, what texts they believed in general were early Buddhist texts. And these are, uh, in the main, the, the, what are called the, the four main Nikayas, Pali Nikayas. These are the places where we find the suttas, that is to say the discourses of the Buddha. I have indeed them behind me, uh, as well as some other texts, which are also early Buddhist texts. Uh, what we have are, uh, I'll just take them in order, the Anguttara Nikaya. That's uh, numerical discourses, discourses that are organized in this book uh, by number. So if the discourse happens to be about a single kind of thing, then it's in the ones. If it's about two things, then it's in the twos. It's not a very useful way of organizing things, but that's one of the ways that the uh, texts were organized back in the day. Another one uh, called the Sangyutta Nikaya, which are uh, connected discourses. This, these are, are discourses that are 
organized by theme, which is a better way of organizing, to my opinion, in my opinion. Uh, but the, the, the themes are, are kind of a grab bag of different kinds of, uh, of approaches or, or, or uh, discussion themes that were around the texts, you know, what people were involved or what sorts of things were discussed uh, in those texts. Another one, uh, Diga Nikaya, these are longer discourses. These are discourses that are organized by length, that is to say some particularly long ones are in here. Uh, perhaps the most famous are the middle length discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya. Most of the, I shouldn't say most, but many of the famous discourses are in this one. This is generally the one that people come to first. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I, I guess if you're going to start anywhere, you might you might start here. Then uh, there is uh, another. Uh, these are four four main nikayas. The fifth nikaya is called the Kudaka Nikaya, which is sort of a, a miscellany uh, of uh, minor texts, uh, minor in quotes. Some of them are not so minor, but in any event, uh, the problem about that Kudaka Nikaya is it's very long. In in other words, it's not in a single book because there's a, a lot of uh, material in that uh, a basket in that group. Uh, but much of it is not early. Uh, there is only a small amount of texts in the Kudaka Nikaya that are early. Uh, that would include uh, the Sutta Nipata. This is a, 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 a relatively new translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. This book includes the commentaries to the Sutta Nipata, which is why it's long. If it were just the Sutta Nipata, it would be a very, very short book. Most of this is commentarial material. Uh, the Dhammapada, which many people will have heard of. Uh, wonderful early book of uh, uh, different uh, verses on, on, on early Buddhism. Uh, the Udana and Itivuttaka, another early Buddhist, uh, pair, pair of early Buddhist texts. Uh, the Terigata, that is the, the poems of the Buddhist nuns, uh, early Buddhist nuns. And the Teragata, which I don't have a copy of, which is... Um, you know, you can get them online, but in any event, I don't have a hardcover copy of it, which is a poem of early Buddhist monks. Uh, these are the standard uh, early Buddhist texts. Uh, as you will see, they're basically their discourses or collections of discourses, smaller or larger. Uh, there also are uh, other texts that are considered early Buddhist texts, in particular the Patimokkha or the, uh, the monastic rules are considered early. Uh, there are certain certain parts of the Vinaya. The Vinaya is includes the monastic rules. It's the not only the rules but the stories behind them are considered. Uh, some of them to be to go very very far back and to be early Buddhist texts. And also, uh, all of the texts I've been showing you so far are texts that have been uh, translated out of Pali, which is um, an early Buddhist language uh, in. It's a dialect of Sanskrit and may have been the language that the Buddha himself spoke or may have been in any event close to the language that the Buddha himself spoke. However, there are uh, uh, other versions of these texts in other languages. In other words, these texts were translated into other languages uh, many, many centuries, millennia ago. And so they... Uh, Early examples of them uh, survive also in Chinese, which are called the Agamas, or in other Indic languages. Uh, a small number also exist in Tibetan. And so what, uh, what we do nowadays, what's, what uh, scholars do nowadays when they want to know about early Buddhist texts is that they do comparative studies. And these are really ongoing at this point. We, they're far from finished. And so they'll find a text, let's say, in the Majjhima Nikaya here, and they will uh, look at it in Pali, and then they will try to find a parallel to that text in, let's say, the Chinese, or in some other Indic language, uh, of which there only are fragments nowadays. And they will see to what extent uh, these texts agree with one another, and to what extent, let's say, the Chinese is different from the Pali. And and so in that way, we can sort of triangulate back to what might have been uh, an original text, or at least gives us some idea of what the original texts might have looked like uh, many, many centuries, millennia ago. Now, the next question that you might think of that might arise in your mind is, uh, 
Okay, so if those are the early Buddhist texts, then what aren't early Buddhist texts? What do we compare these to? In other words, what are, what are the things that we're leaving out here? Uh, we're leaving out, uh, one of the major things we leave out is the Abhidhamma or Abhidharma. These are texts that arose in the centuries after the Buddha's lifetime, which were basically kinds of attempts to compile uh, the Buddhist teachings uh, by taking them out of the, the realm of suttas, or if you might say, discourses, and organize them. And once we start organizing the texts, then there's going to be issues of, of, of reconciling what appear to be uh, conflicts of various kinds, or of filling out what may be information that seems to be missing from the suttas. And so there was, uh, when, we, when the Abhidharma arose, uh, we have new material coming in. And in particular, we have what might, we might call sectarian material coming in. That is to say that once the Abhidharma seems to arise in the, the period when sects were arising, where the, when there begin to be different schools of Buddhist thought. And so there are different versions of the Abhidharma which really differ from one another in certain uh, rather fundamental ways. Uh, th th that is to say, there clearly wasn't an original Abhidharma that then split off, but rather that different schools would come up with their own Abhidharma. Uh, also, the Mahayana Sutras are later Buddhist texts, which would have arisen uh, around the turn of the Common Era, some of them the earlier ones, perhaps maybe a century before the Common Era, into the Common Era in the centuries, early centuries of the Common Era. Those would have been the earlier Mahayana texts. That is to say, maybe 500 or 1,000 years after the Buddha's lifetime. Other texts that were not early Buddhist texts would include things such as histories of the Buddha's lifetime, uh, the Jataka tales, uh, historical chronicles, uh, also uh, the major part of the Kudaka Nikaya, uh, the, uh, a lot of the Vinaya or the uh, monastic uh, rules. Much of that was also later, and much of that is also sectarian in various ways. In other words, it seems to be written from the perspective of a particular school, as opposed to be having been written before there were schools. Uh, there, these are the sort of different ways we distinguish between early Buddhism and later Buddhism, is that the early Buddhist texts seem to be in the main non-sectarian. It's material that's included in all of the schools in one form or another, whereas uh, the sectarian uh, material is material that's really exclusive to one school or another and has to be understood that way. I mean, a perfect example behind me uh, is the, the points, uh, points of controversy. Uh, this is a, a, a text, uh, the Kattavattu, uh, a text from the Theravada uh, uh, sect, the Theravada school. Uh, clearly, it's a controversies, that is to say, uh, things, uh, uh, arguments, points that the Theravadans had uh, that they disagreed with other schools about, and so they wrote a book about that about these controversial points and what the Theravada interpretation would have been. That's a perfect example of a later Buddhist text, something that comes from a later period after the development of schools. And to that end, we could also add the, the commentaries. Uh, I mentioned uh, when it came to uh, the Sutta Nipata that this particular book includes the commentaries to the Sutta Nipata. Those are generally considered quite early. Uh, they might even be considered well, they were, they're not really early Buddhist texts in the sense they certainly didn't go back to the Buddha's lifetime, I would think, but uh, they are some of the earliest commentaries that we have, I believe. Uh, on the, on, however, having said that, in general, all of the commentaries come quite, quite a bit later. Uh, again, they came from uh, a more sectarian time. Uh, people would look at the early suttas and uh, interpret them based on their particular school's interpretation of those texts. Now, uh, again, we don't want to be too uh, firm about this. I mean, there's a lot of material in the commentaries that is non-sectarian. It's just simply explaining what the text says in a, in a more objective kind of way, a sort of way that, that any school could, could agree to. However, uh, we, we, we also we do want to say, though, that the commentaries are later. They don't go back, let's say, to the Buddha himself. They don't go back to the uh, the, the Buddha's own uh, uh, early uh, uh, followers. Now, it's also important to stress and keep in mind that not everything in these early Buddhist texts that I've mentioned is early. In other words, uh, 
We can take a book like uh, the, the Middle Length Discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya, and it's not as though uh, all, of, certainly not, Certainly, we'd, we wouldn't want to say that it all goes back to the Buddha himself. Uh, there, there would have been development over the decades and centuries after his lifetime. And uh, a certain amount of the material in there clearly is not early. Uh, now, how do we distinguish between uh, the, the suttas in here that are early or the parts of suttas that are early and the suttas or parts of sutras, suttas that are late or later? That is, unfortunately... Uh, an object of scholarly uh, dispute and uh, discussion and argument and investigation. It's not the sort of thing that can be answered easily. It's not the sort of thing where they come in different colors or something, you know, where all of the early stuff is in one color ink and all of the later stuff is in a different color ink or something like that. Uh, it has to be, uh, we have to uh, look at these things by, again, comparing them with with other texts in other languages, and then come to a, uh, a good historical reconstruction, a sensible historical reconstruction. Uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, Bhikkhu Analyo is very uh, famous for having done, and other uh, uh, bhikkhus, other uh, monastics as well, other scholars uh, do this kind of thing. I did an earlier video, in fact, recently on the uh, sutta called The Great Forty within the the Middle Length Discourses, where I discussed how certain aspects of the Great Forty seem to have come later, seem to have arisen perhaps in the, the period of the Abhidharma, and, or at least in, during the development of the Abhidharma, and were, uh, seem to have been re, uh, uh, seem to have influenced at least the Pali version of that text, but they didn't so much influence the Chinese version, uh, which again suggests that there is a sectarian Abhidharma here where in what became the Theravada there was influence but what, what uh, the, the, the version of this text that did not become Theravada that went up into China didn't, re didn't retain those kinds of influences perhaps because they hadn't occurred yet. Um, these are the kinds of, of questions we can have and even a text as famous and well known as the Satipatthana Sutta that is to say the the sutta on mindfulness, the, the sutta that that uh, makes mindfulness what it is today. It's our it's our origin and source for that for for mindfulness practice. That seems to have been a sutta that uh, is not so early. Uh, that is to say that there is a core of it that goes seems to be early, but much of what we retain in in the, the sutta we see today seems to have been added to it later. And uh, uh, Bhikkhu uh, Sujato, who wrote, who was one of the writers, one of the authors of this paper I mentioned a bit ago about the authenticity of these early texts, Bhikkhu Sujato has a book uh, about the uh, mindfulness sutta, the sutta on mindfulness, in which he attempts to reconstruct what the earliest version of that sutta might have looked like, what it might have looked like originally, by, uh, again, looking at comparatively what what persisted in other languages and what seems not to have been in other languages. And so starting to triangulate back in what, what might have been originally there and what might have, might have been added later in the various schools. Uh, I'll put a link to his book down below as well as uh, the other source material. So in case you're interested, you can go and look at that yourself. And there also seem to have been some uh, changes made to uh, texts, early Buddhist texts, when it came to the origin and development of the nuns' order, the, the, the order of female monastics. I discussed a bit of that in my uh, video a while back on women in Buddhism. I'll also put a link to that video down below in case you're interested in that subject. Uh, it seems as though uh, uh, later on, after the Buddha's lifetime, there were uh, male monastics who uh, were not very happy about there being uh, female monastics within the order and seem to have monkeyed with some of these early texts in various ways. At least that is one way of looking at this. It's hard to, t hard to know for sure, but we, if we do historical reconstruction, we often find these kinds of things. So uh, the answer here is that we're never going to know for sure which texts are original, which texts might theoretically have gone back to the Buddha, and which texts 
uh, uh, originated later or were developed later or underwent various forms of transformation later. This is an ongoing project and a project that will never be finished uh, because there's always going to be uh, additional potential argument that can could be made on one side or another. Uh, indeed, it's the sort of thing that we, we have to be careful that we can never really know for sure. Uh, at the, even at the best, we're only going to be working with limited information. Uh, although the text that I've been showing you, of this large pile of books and, and further others besides, uh, it looks like a lot of information, and it is. It's an enormous amount of, of textual information going back uh, many thousands of years. But uh, at the end of the day, it's all we have. Uh, we're, and so we're working on limited information. Uh, uh, Archaeological information is great and can help fill out some of our picture of Buddhism back in the day. Uh, but at the end of the day, also, archaeological information is not going to inform us about uh, very much about uh, practice, very much about doctrine and belief. Uh, because at the end of the day, unless things are written down, uh, they don't really reveal much about what people believe and what they practice. And indeed, as we know, uh, uh, none of this material was written down during the Buddha's lifetime. It was written down only centuries after he passed away. It was, it was preserved orally uh, for centuries. Uh, so uh, what we're dealing with is, is something fleeting and something that is going to involve and always will involve a lot of work. That said, the, the corpus of texts, this large corpus of texts that we have today, do present a coherent doctrine, a, a doctrine aimed at uh, increasing our wisdom, aimed at uh, meditative practice, aimed at an ethical life, ethical living, uh, aimed at, at, at ending suffering for us. Uh, and these, these practices all cohere into a single kind of, um, we might say, aim towards ending suffering through uh, purifying the mind, through uh, ethical living, through wisdom, through understanding the way that the world really works, and getting ourselves away from various forms of ignorance. And these also, these texts also include uh, broader cosmological kinds of, of themes, uh, themes of, uh, of heavens and hells and various realms of existence, and uh, an idea of, of beginningless lifetimes going into the past, and rebirth based on karma. And on this channel, on, on my channel, I tend to uh, emphasize the, the former teachings, that is, the teachings about ethics and meditation and wisdom. And I tend to leave aside uh, the other teachings, uh, the more cosmologi cosmological teachings, uh, although uh, I do mention them. I, do, I certainly have videos about them. I had a, vi a video not that long ago about the realms of existence. I'll put a link to that down below, too. Uh, no. And they are indeed a, an object of, of practice and belief by traditional uh, Buddhists. Uh, my own aim is generally secular. However, um, as many of you will know, I am happy to discuss any of it. I think it's all very interesting and, and worth study. I think it's important to separate our ideas of the scholarship from our own practice. That is to say, uh, unless we happen to have a practice which is exclusively informed by scholarship, which not many of us have. I think one of the, uh, one of the very few people who do, does this is Bhikkhu Sujato himself, who I've mentioned various times, whose practice, my understanding anyhow, is that his practice is informed by, by his ideas on early Buddhism exclusively. For the rest of us, uh, we may have a practice that's somewhat different from, let's say, any particular school or any particular belief or any particular uh, fount of scholarship, uh, my, and my own practice is that way. So while I understand the scholarship to say certain things about the Buddha's approach and, and the way the Buddha understood the world, that informs a, 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 a certain amount of the way that I approach my own practice, but not all of it. And I imagine that many of you are the same way. Now there are certain, I think, very important things to keep in mind when it comes to studying and getting to know early Buddhism or even uh, when it comes to uh, uh, creating a practice around early Buddhism. 
And these are that uh, when we look at these early Buddhist texts, uh, what we find is that the Buddhist teachings are presented piecemeal in them. They're not presented in a very organized kind of fashion. As I mentioned, the books are not organized in any particular way that makes them easy for us to get an introduction to the teaching through them. And also, we find by reading these texts, uh, if we read them uh, in detail, we find that the Buddha oftentimes presented the same material in very different ways to different audiences. He might present one particular thing as being of utmost importance at one time, and a different thing being of utmost importance at a different time in front of a different audience. We have to remember that the Buddha taught for many decades during, a, during his lifetime, uh, a, a long time in front of uh, many, many hundreds or thousands of people, certainly thousands of people, uh, that his own opinion might have changed over time, or at the very least, his, his uh, approach to teaching might have changed over time, given the particular environment that he found himself in. And so, uh, when it comes to understanding these teachings, it's extremely important that we uh, contextualize them. That is to say that we understand uh, that, uh, that if we take a particular teaching uh, on its own, we may not really understand what it's saying. We need to put that teaching into the broader context in order to understand it in its real detail and depth. And so, one of the mistakes that I think a, a lot of people make when they come to early Buddhism is to read a particular text and think that that text has the particular teaching right. Uh, and indeed, in some cases, that can be fine, but in other cases, it might be misleading because a particular uh, thing taught in a particular way in a particular text uh, may be taught very differently in other places. And th so this is also, this is always something to keep in mind. And what this tells us is that coming to early Buddhism involves quite a steep learning curve. It involves a long amount of trying to read and understand these texts on their own uh, before we really have a, a full picture of what's being taught or what's being said. And, it's and you might say, well, how do I do that? And all I can say is that that's the reason I have this channel on YouTube. I mean, that's one of the reasons, because I feel, I, I've always felt as though this material in early Buddhism is worth getting across but it's difficult to do so, and it's difficult to find people who are willing to do so. Uh, and, and so, um, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, for, obviously, from my own perspective, from my own understanding, uh, but you have to start somewhere. And so, uh, I hope that, that the material I'm, I'm bringing across here is useful. I think if you do want uh, more information from other places, uh, I did an earlier video on where you can find out about early Buddhism on the internet, where I give a, a number of different uh, other options that you can look for. And I'll, uh, I'll put a link to that up on the screen here. I hope that that's useful to you. Thanks so much to all of my patrons over on Patreon for supporting the work that we do here. If you get benefit out of this, consider joining them. Thanks so much and be well.